Hello, hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. I am super thrilled that you are here for week five of the Artist's Way class that the amazing creatives, Megan Vasilis, Alan Fessenden, Sergio Giovanni, and I are going through the entire process of Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. We've gotten some great feedback. People who are following along have caught up and are really enjoying sort of the process that we're going through as we talk through the things that work for us, the things that challenge us, the, the, the actual creative recovery process that Julia Cameron details in the book. If you're going through it with us, welcome. If you're just joining us, welcome. I hope that you'll get something out of this as we go through each week of this book. It is challenging at times for me, I admit, but on the whole, it's very much worth it. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Megan Vasilis, Sergio Giovanni, and Alan Fessenden. Welcome, y'all. Thank you. Hey, Zelda. Hello, everyone. So here's the thing. I, once again, I get to take a back seat because this week, Alan has graciously agreed to be the host and he's going to lead the discussion. It's going to be something that I'm very excited to see what happens with because it's a tough, it was a tough chapter for me. So I'm really excited. <laughs> no, well, I admit it. I'm excited to, to actually be able to give thoughtful answers instead of, uh, asking the questions and then try to give thoughtful answers. It's it's a few too many balls for me to juggle this week. So Alan, I'm super grateful that you were willing to take this on and take it away. My pleasure, Isolde. Thank you for uh, granting me this opportunity. Uh, totally and my pleasure. Welcome to week five of The Artist Way. It's week six in the podcast, but it's week five in the book. And as Sergio pointed out last week, we were a third of the way through through so i wanted to acknowledge that and uh next week we'll be halfway through very wow. exciting <laughs> yeah i'm excited um, congrats everyone on the first month so uh this is a sense of possibility recovering a sense of possibility and uh, i just want to check in with you guys first how was your week um how were your morning pages and did you get to do an artist day let's start artist date uh let's start with you sergio Hey, Alan, really excited uh, for you to be hosting this week. Thank you. And also, uh, just uh, one more time, congrats, Peru, on completing the first month. I'm looking forward to this next two months yes. and the process. Um, so yeah, this week I did seven out of seven of my morning pages, um, which I feel really good about. That's a couple weeks in a row now. Nice. And uh, yeah, and from time to time, uh, when writing, I started to refer to my pages as journal you know like um hope you're doing well journal or sorry for <laughs> writing so late today journal and, <laughs> and and things like that and um i've even made it a habit to start ending my pages with wish me luck journal <laughs> um very cool no matter i love that no matter uh yeah thank you uh no matter what i write about i'll always end and with the same you know wish me luck journal and essentially I'm just wishing myself luck, right? Every day. And that was kind of neat. But then I started to think about um, if that was like making me want to take more accountability in the things that I want luck for. Like, you know, instead of like, uh, I'm hoping for this, so wish me luck. Maybe instead it's like, let me try to attain that luck or not. You know, I'll keep trying until I get there. Um, and I guess it made me think more about the concept of luck, you know, being in the right place or at the right time or mm. meeting the right person. And like, is that luck? Is that synchronicity? Or to Julia Cameron and some others, is it God? Um, <laughs> I don't know, but it was neat to think about nonetheless. And um, as far as my artist date, um, so yeah, if the crew hasn't uh, noticed by now, I seem to be doing most of my artist dates on the same days that I pick up my new comic books. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, my old high school is actually not too far from my local comic shop. And I decided to walk there um, to my old high school and, and walk the track. There's this big track um, in the back. And it was later in the evening, so there wasn't anyone around. And uh, yeah, it was really nice to, to walk around and, and just get nostalgic and such. And it made me think about high school, of course, I was there, right? But it made me realize that 
although high school was a blast, you know, I had a lot of fun, like a lot of fun, but I feel like it wasn't the best years of my life. You know, some people feel that way. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I think I'm living the best years of my life currently. So that was kind of reassuring. That's um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was my artist date and my morning pages. Isolde, how about you? Were you able to get through all of your morning pages? And did you have an artist date this week? I got through six and a half days of my morning pages. Uh, and that's because uh, today I didn't finish them. I had a really crazy, crazy busy day. And in trying to deal with a couple of different flooding events, uh, instead of being able to spend time uh, writing my morning pages, I had to stop and sop up some flooding from upstairs. So I wasn't able to do as much as I would have liked to have done. But I figure six and a half, like I did, I did a page and a half of my morning pages today. I just didn't get to finish. So so I'm, I'm going to count that as a win. I'm going to count that as an okay, because as my Aikido sensei says, life gets in the way of art, and sometimes you have to deal with a spill or a flood or you know, water seeping in from the wall. So <laughs> so I had to deal with that, and I did. And uh, I, I did go on an artist state, but I one of the things that is hard for me uh, because of the weather, it, mobility can be a little bit of an issue because I have terrible knees and ankles. So I, I I had to walk with a cane partially this week, not because I needed the cane, but because I wanted to be sure that if I fell, that I would be able to keep walking. And so I went walking this week because I had uh, tickets to two shows, I went to see The Music Man and went to see Company. And before The Music Man, I went for a nice long walk uh, before I met a friend of mine, another Megan, actually, for dinner, and uh, and just uh, used the time that I was considering as my artist date sort of to, I love the architecture in New York City, especially in Midtown, so I just walked and walked and walked and spent a lot of time looking up. I just looked up a lot, looking at the, the tall spires of the buildings, the architecture, the filigree, the way things are done now versus the way they were done and just allowed myself to really explore color and shape and line and and allowed it to inform some of the things that I'm doing with my uh, creative art piece a day project and it informed one that actually surprisingly got a lot of people interested and that was one that was I made a, a nature scene but all with square blocks yeah. so I yeah what <laughs> oh yay <laughs> thank you yeah and so so it was this really kind of surreal not quite abstract thing. And I, and I got inspired to do that by, because I had walked around New York and was just looking at color and shape and line rather than trying to be realistic. And it's an exploration that I've always been afraid of because I've always thought I was really into realistic art. But it turns out I'm pretty into abstract art, too, when I'm the one making the art. Who knew? I had no <laughs> idea. And I'm not a visual artist in in the sense that I think of myself as one. It turns out I can do it a little. But I don't think of myself that way. So it was it's really the artist state really opened me up to wait, wait, why why can't I do this? And so that that notion of, hey, wait a minute, I can do this is sort of what this week's artist state opened up for me. That if I can imagine it, then then there's really no excuse for not trying it. And that's where I am. Megan, how about you? I this week managed to do also six and a half days of morning pages, which I was pretty proud of. Um I was kind of jumping back in after a really morning pages light week last week. And mm -hmm. I did find that as I was doing them, I think that that feeling of familiarity had kind of faded a little bit. So it sort of was a bit of an education on exactly why you need to do morning pages every every day. Because for me, at least, it really did feel like it took me a couple of days to sort of rebuild the habit again and rebuild that feeling of being really connected to the words as I was writing them. Um, but towards the end of the week, I was starting to get that feeling back. So I think that was a success. And for my artist date, because it was really cold here in New York and I didn't really want to go on a super long walk, I actually stayed in and I cracked open my bullet journal, which is, I don't know if anyone else bullet journals, but it's like kind of a planner that you design yourself. And a lot of people get really kind of artistic with it. And I'm not like a... a 
visual graphic artist really, but I really like to use that space kind of as a place to put pictures that I've taken, um, just write down ideas that I have and make it kind of at least a little bit aesthetically pleasing in a, in a way that I like. So I just sort of took a whole evening, I got all of my colored pencils and my pens and everything, and I put on some music and I just had like my time with my bullet journal. And it was, it was really nice having this kind of inside artist date. Um, how about you, Ellen? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Megan. That's awesome. That sounds so great. I've heard of these bullet journals before and uh, they always sound interesting to me, but I think probably, probably when I heard about it before, I was like, uh, I don't really plan anything, so I don't need that sort of <laughs> situation. <laughs> uh, and here I am, uh, wishing I had planned more things. Uh, but that's awesome. I, um, I did my morning pages. I think I did them every week. And I just wanted to comment on – Zolda, you said that you start your morning pages off with a, a certain phrase every every time, right? I do? You mean Did, blah blah freaking blah blah blah? Maybe, I thought you said I thought you said like you start it a certain way every time, and maybe I'm wrong, but maybe blah 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 is what you said. There, are t- it, I, it's not the same way every time. I there are times when I don't know what to write. I I will say I have no freaking idea what to say, and then there are times I say if I were someone who knew what to say here, what would I say? And then sometimes it is blah blah freaking blah blah blah. So those are the three oh, general right. ways. Well, I, 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 <laughs> if I were someone who knew what to say here, what would I say? I love that. And I was, uh, when you said that, I was like, oh, I have a thing that I start mine with. And I was like, I wonder what everyone starts theirs with. And since Sergio, you brought it up, I'm going to give you mine. And I start all of mine with good morning, morning pages. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go from there. And sometimes <laughs> I have to write that a couple of times. But <clears throat> usually it's a nice start because I'm like, all right, what's going on? And I check in, like, and then I'll write from there. And I, try to end everyone with i love you and i sign it <laughs> oh that's great oh, so. <laughs> that's great i love that it's very endearing but, alan ah, thank you megan i'm just trying to give myself some love it is, and it a, is. a little reward at the end so like if i you know don't get to the that second half of that last <laughs> that last day i don't get to love myself i'm just kidding I love myself every day <laughs> it's good for you i was thinking it was so fun that uh is older you learn fractions it's good incentive to finish those pages <laughs> it is incentive <laughs> i gotta get to my i love you but if i can't finish when i haven't finished sometimes i'll just end it there i'll be like see you later or i'll be like i'm coming back to this and then i don't make it back but that's okay <laughs> um but you know whatever you guys are doing like obviously life gets in the way and that's cool my all right it's not cool sometimes but it happens and exactly gotta, we can't judge ourselves for that but we just keep trying um, the artist day, I had trouble getting to an artist day this week. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And like a couple weeks ago, they were like, what's your favorite food? And I started like, uh, searching for vegan pierogies and <gasps> I, was like, mm. oh my God. I was like, Oh, someone said that, uh, happy Zoe's happy Zoe vegan bakery in Greenpoint had them. And, but then I looked at their menu they don't. And turns out you have to order them in advance uh, but they called me or they texted me back to be like what do you want and i was like pierogies and they're like you gotta order in advance and i was like ah well actually i was like how much notice do you need and then i i ended up actually going by there today randomly uh and they were closed ah <laughs> but um well, and then sense. and then i had this other idea that i was going to go to uh another vegan spot that's opened up this past like during the pandemic is uh, ava's lifeline and they have like uh, delicious desserts and I took my dog to the park and I was like well I'll just <laughs> it's like a couple blocks over from the park and I was like well maybe I'll go um, there on the way home and they were closed on Sunday so I was like having so much trouble and then today I was like what am I going to do and then one of my um, one of my favorite yoga teachers uh, posted her like class and I hadn't really seen her classes come up recently uh, and I'll give her a shout out Lizzie Faulkner she's amazing and awesome. she was teaching at uh, Vital. Have you guys heard of this place? Mm-mm. Vital. And uh, there's one in Williamsburg and there's one in Manhattan. And it's like a gym, but they have a, it's a giant space and they have all this rock climbing stuff, which is one of the things I've been interested in doing but haven't ever done. So it's on my, like, what do I want to do? Rock climbing. But it also still <laughs> scares the shit out of me. 
Pardon me. Uh, <laughs> warning, nope, warning. Just, that's right. Now I have to put the little E for explicit on the episode. E. 15 minutes in. 15 minutes in. <laughs> Is that it? All right. Um, so, so yeah, so I went to the, to her class and it's just a huge space. And I was like, okay, I got to come back here. And they have the yoga classes and their membership fees are not, you know, in, insane, but I was just like so amazed by this, this space. And I, I took a picture cause outside the yoga studio, there's like an outdoor, um, climbing wall mm. and on the second floor. It's like a smaller one, but it's like outdoors and you can do it, but it's like rainy today. And I just love the idea of like that playground that people can't get to <laughs> because it's too rainy or like no one's on it, but like it's mm. a, fu- a promise of a future, a future good time. Mm-hmm. So that was my, you know, I know I've done yoga before <laughs> I did my 30 day yoga challenge, but that was ended up being my, uh, my artist state. And it was very rewarding. Cause I, then I, um, walked around Greenpoint a little bit and, I love that little area. So that was cool. That is Uh, neat. Thank you. Um, And I just wanted to say the comic books, your little routine of going to the the bookstore every week is, is, it just brought back such a feeling for me, uh, Sergio, of like that routine. And I love that it's part of your, part of your routine. And I just thought of like, oh, you go and you pick up the books. And I just sort of miss comic books in that way. And like that sort of, magical excitement of going to go get somebody else's creative work actually it's like boom that's uh, really that's really cool to hear alan you're really uh got big cheese face on right now because that's awesome <laughs> um it's never too late to get back into it and um you have two fans uh well i'm sure as old as into comic books as well but i know uh megan uh likes to read as well so if you ever wanted anyone to go to a shop with you or some recommendations suggestions uh, I know we, we would love to do that. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. I got to get the latest titles that are key and important to the world. <laughs> or important to you, right? <laughs> or important and, to uh, me. And the cool so, thing about the medium now is that there's a lot of uh, uh, indie um, books and stories out. So if you're not into the superhero stuff, you know, there's there's a lot of great material out there for you uh, in that uh that medium as well oh yeah you know what's got me really excited right now is i've been watching the um oh man <laughs> never mind there's a, some there's a series on hbo right now what is that show peacemaker called? peacemaker i've been watching peacemaker <laughs> yeah and that show's hilarious <laughs> it's hilarious and i used to read uh the vigilante comic books and i'm pretty sure it's this vigilante and they make mm-hmm. and he was so serious and such a, like a a dark character yeah and they make him such a clown in this show and it's just like i love he's comic like the book. opposite of, yeah. of the, what he was in the comics yeah that's true <laughs> such a little like little goofy weasel and it's so funny because all he wants to do is kill <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, i love how I'm that's sorry, funny so... <laughs> well it's just you, got... you know it's gotta see the show but it's because mm. mm-hmm. he's such a i mean he really was a dark and and it's I guess it's this character that doesn't have a set following because he's been a lot of uh, incarnations is what happened what I mm. discovered when last time I looked it up. Mm-hmm. All right, I want to jump a little differently. I just want to talk about tasks real quick. We sort we sort of stuff those at the end, and I want to ask you guys if there's um, something you responded really well to in these tasks, or, and and if you had any issues with the task or something you you resisted or didn't want to do. And let's start with you, Megan. Well, I, I did all of the tasks this week, and I think my, my favorite, the one that actually ended up resonating me with me the most, was the 10 items I want to own task, because um, I think for me, just making that list, as someone who, who grew up without a lot of resources and without a lot of money, like just writing down this list of relatively small things that, that I want that I really just have not bought, even though I do have the resources now. It just sort of showed me how much I'm not using the resources that I have and how I'm sort of sending a message to myself by doing that, that I'm not, I'm not worth certain things or certain comfort, even something really small. Like one of the things on the list was, oh gosh, like, like a weekend trip away. Like I, it's something I've, I've literally never done. I've never given myself like a weekend vacation by myself, not not visiting family, not doing it for, like for or with someone else, just like completely uh, on my own. And solo trip. Yeah, solo trip. And 
yeah, it, it just sort of showed me how um, that sense of possibility, I, I guess, can be impacted by like the the luxuries you allow yourself to have, I guess, in in, in your life. That was what I what I got out of that exercise. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I like that one too. Uh, Isolde, how did you feel? Um, I had a few things, but the the one that's sort of it's a woulda coulda shoulda thing, but it's the it's the one number four. If I were twenty and had money, list five adventures and add images to your visual image file. Uh, the the thing it's hard, this is hard for me because. Uh, it is it is hard for me to envision myself at 20 having money. I was working three full-time jobs and paying my way through college. So I it was not possible for me to to do the things that I wanted to do, but if I had had a lot of money, uh overcoming that resistance because there is some resistance. There's a part of me that's going wreck and freck and I didn't have money. I hate this question. And you know, because because I was I had student loans at the yin yang. I was really in a bad way financially. I you know there was a month when I had to decide between food for myself and cat litter for my cats, or be homeless. And so literally, I was like, ah, what do I do? And so so reading that question was a little tough, and thinking about it was tough. But then I went, okay, what if I relax? And what what would that have been like? I would have rested more. I would have relaxed more, and I certainly would have traveled more. I would rent a motorcycle and ride down the Amalfi Coast, for example. You know, I mean, I ride, but I don't have a motorcycle now. I sold my motorcycle before we moved to New York City. But I would definitely rent a motorcycle and ride down the Amalfi Coast. I would spend more time on tropical islands. I would go to the Maldives and swim in bioluminescent algae. I would, there were all of these different things that are far flung explorations that I would do that I that what's interesting about them is is immediately I went well okay maybe Rich won't ride motorcycles down the Amalfi Coast with you but he might ride a scooter because we've done that and uh, we went to Crete and we rented little motor scooters and like Vespas and rode all over Crete on Vespas so he might be willing to rent a Vespa if not a full motorcycle or, or get him a sidecar uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll make him run it ride pillion. That would be funny. Um no, but I mean, but the thing is, it's like immediately where my brain went was, well, why don't you make a plan for that? You want to go to the Amalfi Coast, you've wanted to go to the Amalfi Coast for decades, start making your plans, start saving your pennies. So, that's kind of what these all of these tasks did for me is okay, you didn't do it at 20, for example. What can you do to make it an approximation of it happen now or next year or the year after that? So uh, there's a little bit of, of immediacy to my wanting to do that because I, I had to bring – yes, I'm going to bring everybody down. Yet another friend of mine died this past week. So, oh, my God. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, thanks. I'm sorry it, it, to hear that. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the age, I guess, where people my age are, are – uh, are dying and and so i there's a little bit of an urgency as i was reading these tasks there's there's a little bit more of an immediacy and an urgency to it like get off your ass as old you you know live every day like it like it's your last because it could be so so that's kind of what all of these tasks did for me is they put in me this this real desire to see as much of the world as i can uh i forget who's who's oh thanks sergio. uh sergio sergio how about you? Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to say again, I'm really sorry for uh, the friend that you lost. Thank you. My condolences. And um, also, Isolde, you ride motorcycles. Yes. That's that's awesome. Of course, <laughs> of course, that's something that you do. You are definitely a, a Jane of all trades. And I think, <laughs> I guess Jill maybe makes more sense, but Jane just sounds better phonetically to me. Okay. Um, but yeah, you are definitely a Jane of all trades or Jill of all trades. Um, that's awesome. And also, I wanted to just comment on um, Megan's um, talking earlier about wanting to do a solo trip and never doing that. You should definitely, definitely do that. Um, it's it's a really great experience. I want to. I would like to do more myself in the future, but I, I have been able to do that in the past. Just go away to a to a new town for a weekend by myself, and. Um, it's definitely a really rewarding 
experience. So uh, I hope you do get to do that and we'd love to hear about it if, if you do. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make it happen. Yay! <laughs> awesome. Yeah, you have to. Awesome. So you're the artist way at work here. <laughs> um, as far as the task, I think the last, the final task for me um, is probably the one that hit me the most. And that one was, um, who do you blame for, for being a blocked artist or for, for blocking you? And I, I couldn't really point a finger at anyone other than me. So the answer for, for that was me. And I guess just the revelation that the person I blame for being blocked is, is probably me it was, um, I guess something I knew, but um, yeah, I think that's the task that kind of resonated with me or I had a, the biggest takeaway from this week. Uh, same Sergio. I was like, uh, who am I supposed to blame for this? Like, it's gotta be mm -hmm. me, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. No one else is really making me do stuff, but you know, like, uh, I think, uh, being single is like easier, right? Like who else do you have? Or, you know, being like a non-parent, mm -hmm. you're like, well, I can't blame my kids or mm -hmm. whatever. That's true. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. I felt like the, that was definitely the answer that i had and then i uh i loved these all these these uh tasks because it was like making a list and then what really got me was like making a <laughs> she says make an image file i was like an image file i haven't made any files of anything and now i'm i felt like i was tra uh time traveling back to like 20 years ago when i used a computer in, in any way mm -hmm. like people are supposed to use computers Early out years, <laughs> shout out, shout out to the out years. <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, and then I, um, I liked, the, I drew myself in the creative block. She's like, draw yourself, and I was like, oh my god! And I just drew myself <laughs> on the on the couch with an iPad. Ooh, <laughs> is everyone okay? Some sorry, something's sorry. happening. Woohoo! All right, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, but I I drew myself on my iPad with that thing, so uh, that was fun for me. Uh. But the images just made me think like, oh, okay, this is, oh, I haven't really wanted stuff. I always find myself not knowing what I want. Like I'll want stuff, I'll want stuff, and then Christmas will come or whatever holiday that, or birthday, and I'll be like, um, I don't want anything. I don't know what I want. So this is like a interesting idea. And at some point I was just like, I want a Tesla. And I was like, but I don't want to be an asshole about it. And then I looked up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That but... was great. No, that was great. That was very that was very funny. <laughs> I want a Tesla, but I don't want to be an asshole about it. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. No, no. And then I looked it up. I was like, what's that? What's going on with Tesla? And they're like having a truck coming out in like end of twenty twenty two and it's just the most bizarre, like science fiction looking truck, like all angles. And I was like, absolutely, this is the, <laughs> this is the this truck is the, for me. This is the ugly ass Tesla that I that I want. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, sixty nine thousand? How reasonable? And for a second, I believed it was reasonable. I was like, wait, I don't have like sixty. I'm sh I don't know what cars are supposed to cost anymore. But in my mind, I guess I allowed myself to believe that that was possible. So that's good. The artist way is working. That's right. That's so right. <laughs> yeah. Believe it's possible. Believe in it. And uh, I w while we're here, I want to just go to task number nine. My payoff for staying blocked is um, how did you guys, since we, since Sergio, you started that, do um, you want to answer that first? Um, sure. Uh, I just want to reiterate. Or you uh, don't have to answer about... it, by the way, but <laughs> if you want to. Oh, no. I wanted to no, see what cool. people thought. Um, yeah, I just wanted to first reiterate what your uh, your revelation and what Zoldu was saying, right? Anything is possible. Mm. Um, and as far as that, yeah, I feel like I um, I came to that answer a few weeks ago um, as far as what is the payoff. And I think I talked about it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I talked about it on uh, one of the episodes where I felt like um, being blocked or like blocking myself, you know, the procrastinating or the the judgments and, and kind of stopping myself from trying certain things um, because I'm afraid. I think the, um, that that's, that's why I'm doing it because I'm afraid. So um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? What's the, what's, asked what's the payoff for staying blocked? The payoff. Yeah. yeah. The payoff was why, um, why are you letting that block you kind of, I think like what, mm -hmm. what is that? What's right, your yeah, reward the, for, for staying that way? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so for me, I feel like the reward is um, not having to, 
to confront those fears and not having to take that chance of, of failing, which I said a few weeks ago was, was something I was afraid of. And I think that's why I procrastinate and stuff. So I don't have to fail. Mm. Um, and I, I think that's, that's the answer for me, if that makes sense. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, what about you, Isolde? First of all, uh, it's a it's a tough question, isn't it? To, to to sort of look at yourself and go, oh crap, what is there? There is something I am getting by not doing the thing that I said I wanted to do or the thing that I said that I was going to do. So Sergio, your your point is well taken. That yeah, I think that that's part of it. Uh, a fear of failure for me. Mm. A little bit of this is it's it goes in a slightly different direction. It's not so much a fear of failing, it's a fear of wasting my time and a fear of wasting my energy. So some of this is uh, this thing that I'm working on, is it worth the work? And some people will look at me and go, well, you have to write the crappy book before you can write the good book. You have to write, you know, sing the crappy song before you can sing the, the really great song or whatever the creative thing is. And uh, so some of it makes sense to me on that level, but like with my with my murder mystery uh, at the last writing group, I was uh, reading to you all the synopsis that I was writing for the book, and as part of my realizations for this week in the morning pages, I was stuck. I could not get past what I'd read you. Could not get past it. Could not get past it. And it wasn't just that I was pro procrastinating. I was actively getting angry every time I sat down to write that freaking synopsis. I was getting pissed. And I finally went, okay, what is this? What am I doing to myself? And I realized that what I was doing to myself was I was not addressing the fact that there is a very big part of me that wants to self-publish this book like I have self-published all the others instead of trying to fit myself into a particular niche or, or box that an agent or an editor would expect me to be in because I've never fit into boxes neatly. So it would be a waste of energy and a waste of time to keep trying because I've always given myself like 50 agents slash editors. I'll send out 50 queries and then I'll stop. And after 50, if nobody's interested, I'll self-publish. And now I'm like, do you really want to spend 50 again? Or is it better for you to go in a different direction? So the payoff for me in that situation was to make that I had to make that realization that I need to revisit the notion of self-publishing this book instead of just blithely and blindly going towards, I'm going to write the synopsis, I'm going to make it happen no matter what, when maybe it's not the right move for me. So it's not just a fear of failure because, yes, someone not wanting to pick up my book is a kind of a failure, but I can also do it self-publishing because the book publishing revolution has come and arrived. But also, what if it's not the right path, right? So what if you're stuck because you're trying to bulldoze your way into a direction that isn't the right direction for you, that isn't mm. being in flow, right? And so that's something that as I was, as I was thinking about it, fear of failure, fear of screwing up, fear of all of that, fear of other people judging you, fear, all of that is valid, absolutely. But what if part of why you're stuck is because you're trying to forge a path that isn't the best one for you? And that's a very real possibility, as is witnessed by me, but also I think other people too. You keep going, you know what? I want to be a dancer. I want to be a dancer. I want to be a dancer. No matter what, I want to be a dancer. I'm going to dance ballet. And you're like, okay, well, maybe you're not going to dance ballet because you don't have the right physique for dancing ballet, but you'd be a great square dancer or clogger or modern dancer or something like that. Mm -hmm. So pushing in that direction might be good for you if only to learn the lesson that maybe it wasn't the right direction after all. But at some point you kind of have to go, am I stuck in this quote unquote rut because I've been trying to go somewhere I'm not meant to go. So that's my thought on that. Megan. Yeah. I, I was thinking about this while I was reading the chapter and I actually come up with something really similar to you, Isolde. I think not only do I feel failure, but I also fear what I would call like the sunk cost feeling like like the sense that I'm 
beating my head against the wall and that I just don't have what it takes to get to where I want to go. And my payoff for staying blocked is that I don't have to face that potential reality. You know, I can mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can sort of stay in a place of infinite possibility if I'm not working on anything. Like, <laughs> oh, I, I could be doing all this stuff that I'm not doing, but w- once I'm actually working on something and I'm committed to a path, then that's energy I can never get back once I've invested into that project. And right. I, I think what, what helps me with that is, yeah, thinking of it more like, well, each project really helps me figure out like far better than just sitting around not not working on my creative stuff with each thing I do work on even if that specific thing doesn't become the thing I publish or if this book never really gets to the point that I want it to get it it will as long as I'm open to possibilities and I'm working on on something then that's much more likely to lead me towards a path that that will eventually work for me but I do tend to get stuck in that place of um worrying a lot that I'm investing in the wrong thing wasting my time in the wrong place when I might get to my ultimate goal faster if I worked on something else. So then, um, yeah, I think that that's where I get stuck. Yeah. That's interesting, Megan, because like when we're that, that time we're spent not working on stuff, like what are you, are you, you're saying you work on other stuff or you're just avoiding it? I think I, I tend to avoid it like, um, or, or I'll, I'll create like, systems of busy work i I am so amazing at at coming up with reasons to do like real creative work i will (laughs) i'll like suddenly decide i have to create all these folders and filters for my email because i'll be so much more creative if i can just make sure er everything coming into my inbox is going into its own little slot and that that does that does create space in my inbox but is it really the best use of my time to spend you know hours on that when i could be writing my book just things like that i find like busy work for Mm -hmm. myself to do that's one of the ways that i that i kind of block myself i think I relate oh, to you, that so yeah. so intensely. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I was going to say it's classic avoidance and welcome to the club. We have cookies. Absolutely. <laughs> you know. We love cookies. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that there, what you just said is bang on, uh, Megan. It's, it's super easy and very seductive to go, oh, rather than doing the thing that I said I wanted to do because of whatever – reason i'm gonna go i i have to wash the dishes i have to scoop my cat's litter box i have to sort Mm -hmm. the mail i have to fold the laundry and all sorts of things you know i admit yes my apartment flooded and yes i had to take care of that but i could have very easily not turned on the dishwasher but instead i focused on that instead of doing the writing that i wanted to do do you see what i mean so so there there are ways that i think as as Rona, who Roma Strathman is the world's greatest Aikido teacher. I will say that right now without fear of contradiction. She's amazing. She'll send you flying 15 feet through the air before you know what your name is. And when she says life gets in the way of art, because she said it to me the first time when I was about to test for my brown belt. And all of a sudden, I, I just couldn't work got crazy and I wasn't coming to class. And she's like, well, you know, life gets in the way of art. You'll be back. And when you're back, then we'll test you for the brown belt. I was like, great. And. I felt guilty for a little while. And she says, guilt wastes your energy. Stop doing that. And I went, you're so right. So so even if you avoid whatever it is you said you wanted to do, beating yourself up about it afterward doesn't actually gain you anything. In fact, it wastes more energy. So I just wanted to say that. Sorry, Alan, please go on. No, guilt wastes your energy. I think that's so important to hear or to like, I, I took a deep breath when you said that. I was like, <gasps> Oh, goodness. <laughs> That's like cool. Um, uh, no, but I, I relate to that. I'm like constantly w- walking around my apartment, like cleaning up things, moving things, getting mm-hmm. ready to do something. Mm-hmm. Wait, but I have to move this thing over there. And how come I never put that in the dishes? I've collected all the dishes, but now suddenly there's a cup out. Okay. Well, I'll go <laughs> do that. And then, oh, there's something gotta in take the care sink. Of this cup. Oh, the trash is full. I got to take the trash out. It's right. It's a nightmare, and like uh, I think a friend of mine once, or some, I'm sure somebody's said this, but like clean, cleaning is like the death of the artist, or something like that. Clean, cleanliness. <laughs> I <sighs> can see that. Or as Rich calls himself, he's a one more thinger. You know, oh, I just have to do this one more thing. Oh, this oh, one yeah. more thing. This one more thing. And and it does. It gets in the way, but it also. I wonder if sometimes it gives you a little rest. Like there's, I think as artists, 
we can be in flow state, and I hope we're going to talk about what that means in a minute, or we can feel pressured either by ourselves or by deadlines or by others' expectations to make our art. And sometimes you just need a freaking break. Sometimes you need to feel okay with not doing. And as long as you're not, how do I put this? Like there's a difference to me between avoiding the creating that you said you wanted to do, that you plan to do, and deciding for yourself that for a minute, you're going to just sit and not feel guilty and not do anything and just kind of recharge for a minute and get back to your center. That to me is so worthwhile, even if you're in the middle of this high pressure, make your art situation, because everybody needs a moment to breathe. Absolutely. I, I think that you're dead on on that. I just feel like I'm constantly feeling like I could have done more and so guilt is mm. is heavy on my mind or like you know i admire people who clean in the morning <laughs> and then just have the day like i was my cleaning day i'm done i'm just chilling for the rest of the day and i'm like but um <laughs> isn't there something else i should be doing right uh, so it's so hard all right um i want to get back into the book the chapter um recovering a sense of possibility which is so funny because uh megan you said (laughs) you like living in the world of possibility so it's like we have the possibility out there but if we run towards it is it going to run away so um it starts with uh it says limits and i took this line from the from the early on in the chapter it says are you going to run for the bus or it says pray to catch the bus then run as fast as you can um, and I thought this was because we're talking about like the limits we self impose on ourselves in this chapter. And so I really like that line because it was just say like, you gotta believe in the abundance of the universe, but then you also have to work for it. So believe and then work. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. is all you want to start us off with the limits and, and how you, what what they mean to you in this regard and and how you feel about that sure so i guess the thing that i uh a, a, an old friend of mine was in a coven and her wiccan priestess said to her you cannot cast a spell to lose weight while eating a snickers bar And when my friend Tina said that to me, I was like, yes, that is a truism. Sure, absolutely. You you have to put your money where your mouth is and do do the thing that you said you were going to do. But I think the most important thing that that came out of that whole section to me was accepting that you're able to achieve what you're trying to achieve. And that can be tough because I, I don't remember if I said this in writer's group or in last week's podcast session because we're in both together which I think is awesome uh and that is that in every story in every book that I write I get to a point where it's not just imposter syndrome it's more like uh just there's a little voice that comes on that says Isolde I'm not sure you're writer enough to do this Mm -hmm. piece justice Mm -hmm. not not in a in a shaming way or in a guilty way, it, it, more in a, you just don't have the skills yet. You know, mm-hmm. like I have this grandiose vision for what I want to achieve for the book I want to write. And in the middle of it, there's so much going on. I'm trying to keep so much straight. And I kind of go, I wonder, I wonder if this is too much. And I don't feel guilty about it. I just feel like I'm not there yet. And, and I don't beat myself up about it. I'm like, honestly, assessing is this my limit as a creative right now? And if so, what can I do to improve that? But now I'm sort of getting to a place where if I decide that I want to achieve it, I have to accept that if I can imagine it, I'm able to do it. And and that's one of the things that my little daily art piece that I'm doing every single day for a year, which is really scary, uh, two-dimensional art, that's what that has done for me because I've never been able to do two-dimensional art. And now all of a sudden I'm doing it every single day. And so I keep showing myself again and again and again that what I envisioned is what I am able to achieve. And accepting that is helping me accept that with my writing too. So that's my thought on it. 
Uh, thank you. Sergio, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I, I really relate it to what you were just saying, Isolde. Um, first, I wanted to say that I like how Alan uh, posed this question and, and sentiment of uh, that Julie was trying to express for the section of the book with belief and then work, right? And I feel like it's kind of similar to what I was talking about earlier as far as luck and taking action. Um, so um, yeah, I thought that was neat, uh, the correlation there for me. And Isolde, as far as um, what you were saying about, you know, when you're like halfway through a project or towards the end and you start to, to think about it and, and, and you question whether it's, it's the best it can be and things along those lines, that happens to me all the time when I get towards the end of a project. And um, I'm a little more hard on myself uh, than you are, um, unfortunately, as far as some of the questioning that happens when I do get towards the end of, of a project and I get nervous about finishing it. Um, and it's happening right now, currently. It is a, a short story that I started a few weeks ago and I'm finding difficult to, to finish because I'm questioning um, if it could have been better. You know, I'm rereading the first few pages and I'm thinking like maybe the whole tone could have been different and things like that. And it's just, um, it can be difficult. Um, and I guess as far as limits in this section, I, I guess what I have to accept uh, is that I'm capable, right? That I'm capable of finishing these things and, and that they, they're gonna be okay, they're gonna be good. And if they're not, then that's okay as well. Yeah, absolutely. You can always um, edit. <laughs> that's the, that's always... my problem is that I, I, I do too much editing before I'm even finished. So I'll write like two or three paragraphs and then I'll reread those and rewrite them. When I, what I should do is just write the whole story, especially if it's a short, you know, just write the whole first draft instead of writing half of it and then rewriting that first half before I even finished it. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. I think that that's an issue for me. Yeah. It sounds like it's like a, it's a, a, one of the ways you block yourself or, or something. Mm. Um, let's go over to Megan. How do you feel about uh, the limits? <laughs> that we put on ourselves and how do you feel about um uh, uh breaking through them yeah i think to be to be successful i found that i have to hold two ideas in my head almost simultaneously i have to believe first of all that i can do the thing i want to do because kind of like she talks about in this chapter if i don't really believe it then i i won't be able to make myself sit down every day and, and do the work. I have to believe it's it's possible and that I can do it. But at the same time, I sort of have to impose a limit on myself because I also have a tendency to go into cycles of pushing myself way beyond where I should go at this stage or, and then burning out. And um, so I sort of have to be able to hold that, that, that balance at the same time. Like, yes, I have this big vision and I wanna head in that direction, but this is like the small piece that I'm working on right now. I have to keep almost tunnel vision on so that I can focus on whatever thing I'm trying to accomplish now that contributes to that, to that bigger goal without getting so consumed by the, the bigger goal that I feel like I have to do everything right now. And then I end up overextending myself and then not getting anything done. And I think one of the, the hardest lessons that I've had to learn as a creator is that sometimes it's almost like, like in a video game, you have to unlock certain levels. You have to do a certain amount of work at level like three before you can get to level four. And I always want to skip levels and like jump up to level seven <laughs> or whatever. But it's, it's really like, I'm finding that I'm a lot more successful if I just have that vision for like getting to level seven, but be content with level three for for now like do the work at level mm. at level three and know that that's what's going to eventually get me there oh i like that yeah. like a little uh strategic mindset to be like it's a you have to build upon what you've done already to get go there it's also to level up what's that it's like an rpg it's like an rpg game yeah, <laughs> to yeah. level up you gotta you gotta do a lot of grinding to level up don't worry megan you're gonna get to level seven in no time <laughs> <laughs> thank you sergio i'm glad you believe in me we all believe in you. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I've been thinking, sometimes I think about it, my game, I, this game I play and I put too much time into it. I'm like, oh, I'm so, I have all this 
accumulated power in this game and I'm just like who cares I wish I had <laughs> accumulated power in my life and in my work and I'm like if I could just figure out how to video game or strategize my life in that way that like, to play like a game then I feel like I'd, I'd have a, a key into like moving myself like through a few more levels you know what's interesting about that I, I don't remember how long ago 10 years ago maybe now holy crap i'm mm -hmm. old uh there was this like a todoist or a list kind of app that is a uh it was an rpg and as you completed your real life to-do tasks like take out the garbage or go to grocery shopping when you marked it down you you like you've unlocked the key to asbara and and <laughs> the the, the to-do app was an rpg and it was a it was a way of getting people who are gamers to get more interested in doing sort of their real life tasks mm. because they were going to get coins or health potions or whatever i thought that that it was really interesting but you know I, Honestly, Alan, to to hear your take on it is so fascinating because 20 years ago, the notion of someone spending a lot of time on a video game was it was a fringe thing. Right. But then yeah. we 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 came into this. Now we're in this arena where that's this is people gameplay for their living yeah, and yeah. they design Definitely. games and they you know, they're so. You know, not that I'm saying go and become a, a professional gamer. That's not what I'm saying. But, but like one of the things that's happening is, I think that that as technology evolves, the things that are possible are evolving. You know, down to, okay, maybe you're not a professional gamer, but what if one day you wrote the storyboards for the next big hit video game. It's kind of mm. like a screenplay, you know? So there, there are all of these things that you might not realize you're gaining from being a player in this game. Because playing those games, those games are written by brilliant writers. There's such a wealth of mm -hmm. world in each of these games that I think going through and figuring it out and, and, and making the headway and leveling up and doing everything else that you're doing in, in some way, does inform the rest of the creative work that you're doing, even if it's not something that you see specifically right now. And I'm not saying go spend the rest of your life gaming. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am saying that, that again, <laughs> guilt wastes your energy. So if you want to do something else, doing something else is great, but feeling guilty that you have not done something else because you spend time playing this game kind of makes me go, hmm, what if that is actually building your skills for your screenwriting. You know, what if that's what if that is doing that? And I don't know because I know Cameron would look at me and tisk at me for having said that. But I think that the the wealth of our experience, whatever you choose to focus on, is all sand for the sandcastle. And some of it may be wet sand that you can't use and some of it may be wet sand that's perfect. So, you know, who are we to judge right now for what we've already done? It's it's more about what are you going to do next that becomes important. No, exactly. And this game is not beneficial in any way. It's this is a stupid, <laughs> stupid, stupid game. No, I like <laughs> it's... I like that you had that disclaimer because it, 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 I feel like you're aware that there are beneficial games, right? There's definitely games where you could learn no, that... about history and learn, you know, help your craft, whether you're a musician and stuff. But I just like that you like had to start with, well, this isn't one of those things that I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I mean, I do think about it because she does talk about like giving your time and, and, and taking a breath. And it is a moment where I'm just like, let me just do this. But it almost feels like uh, a work and I'm not actually getting rest. I'm just like going through the motions mm -hmm. of trying to collect as much junk without spending money on this game. So right, it's, right. it's uh, a, <laughs> it, it, it has its benefits and it, it lets me check out for a sec, but you know, I've, whatever it's it's what I, what I've done now um, <clears throat> so I wanted to just point uh, so I, I wanted to bring this up real quick because it's definitely been something we've talked about and this chapter is very God heavy right and I, oh yes as all you wanted to mm -hmm. say something about this and um, there there's it's a heavy leaning on it and I felt it I was like whoa wee really good. really hard to avoid those gods and you know as much as i want to hear them as good orderly direction as she says mm -hmm. we can think of it it's uh it's a lot of pressure and and 
it's hard to maybe switch that out for the universe or whatsoever. So, uh, uh, Zolda, do you want to start us off with this? Okay. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I. It's it's tough because it feels like she's taken an anvil and she's beating you over the head with the anvil. <laughs> and for people who for whom that particular spiritual direction works that's great you know it might be very useful to you but and even some people for whom that is their spiritual direction they might be like oh I, w- I may want to have more of a separation i feel like one of the things that i want to say is ultimately you are the boss of this book it mm-hmm. is not the boss of you so when you are reading it when i am reading it i'm constantly going flow 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 that's that to me is 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 a worthy substitute for god not because of my religious beliefs or non-beliefs but more because i feel very much like and i think i've said this before that that it places some weird stuff on you that god gets the credit if you succeed because god is the source but you get the credit uh, you get the blame if you fail because you didn't open up enough or you didn't you know, believe strongly enough or you didn't Mm. align yourself well enough with this God facet of of creative recovery. And and there's a weird implied blame in there that I really don't care for because a lot of this is if you just realize that God is your source, then you realize it's all infinite. Well, what if you went, okay, I don't have to look at it as God versus human. What if I look at it as as possibility, like what she talks about without having to go that the possibility stems from only one source, which in her eyes is God. And and she even, there's a point at which she, she says something like, God is my source and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, God is your source. But then later in, this, in the same chapter, she says, God is our source. And that I find problematic, again, because there is this implied blame if you mess up, if you don't do as well as you might have done, since she set it up that God is going to get you everything, that the only problem seems to be, if you don't do it right, is that you didn't do it enough. You didn't run for the bus quickly enough or whatever. You know what I mean? So that was a problem for me in reading this, and I want to separate the two. It is not that you are the one to blame if things don't go well, but God is, is going to get the credit if things do go well. It's more that this is a, a process for each of us that's going to be very individual, and if God plays a role in that for you, great. And if something else does flow, universe, the sacred, the river of the unconscious, whatever it is, then that's okay too. And that was my thought on that. Uh, Sergio, Wait, do you have uh, any thoughts on it? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just want to jump in here because I, this is the second time you've brought that up of like, of who gets the credit or God gets the credit if you do well, mm-hmm. right? And it has me thinking about um, my cousin Vinny, and she <laughs> he he wins this case at the end, and she says, and he says. Thank you to Marissa Tomei's character. And she says, oh, my God, what if after every case you win, you have to go ahead and say thank you to somebody? And she just really comes for him. It's like, <laughs> you got to really say thank you. And I just think, like, God's not going to get the credit for your book. Your name's going to be on that book, right? Whatever. No one's going to be like, oh, God wrote that book for Isolde. Like, the the point is that she's making – and I and I do understand what you're saying. Like, she does sort of – I do have issues with this. But I, I think what I, it is, like, this, like – gratitude and 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 allowing yourself to believe in the possibilities right but that recovering that sense of possibility and not um and and whether it's god or the universe or the flow state it's like you didn't get there all by yourself somebody created a computer that helps you write somebody created uh sound your or observe sound waves and figure out how to pass those along there's a lot of things, a lot of work that's already been done for us, and we have that abundance at our hands right now. And so that, to me, is God. That with all the work that's come ahead of us and all the access we've got to to do things for that. So, <laughs> sorry to jump in there, but I just I keep thinking like, it doesn't matter if we have to give credit to to people before us. Like we're still we still have to do the work, and we're gonna get that credit, or we're not gonna get the satisfaction of having done it. So, it's, and I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. I do. I, I totally understand the blame thing, but I also feel like um, we shouldn't uh, blame. <laughs> I, absolutely, and that and and to to address your point, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that it is that that 
the di- the dichotomy she sets up in this is that there is this great source of amazing stuff if you just believe in it hard enough. And some on some of that, if you don't believe in it hard enough, that's one of the reasons you fail, right? right? Yeah. And and mm-hmm. that that is the thing that I get really, I'm like, oh, that really, Likewise. that's hard for me because circumstances sometimes keep you from doing the thing that you wanted to do. You know, I, I'm reminded mm-hmm. of the phenomenal movie, The Natural, right? Robert Redford was, he had a cannon for an arm and then, you know, a horrible thing happened to him and and, and he was nowhere like he could have been because he, you know, he was shot and all this other stuff. So, so he, he, he was, he had a thunderbolt for an arm and then it, he had to come back and reinvent himself and do something else. And, and he still, he was still an, a great baseball player, but he was no, no way was he the same as he had been before, his, before she shot him. So, so oh, yeah. how, how do we, how do we do that? How do we, how do we go? Okay. It's let's say he had this guy, you know, they called they called him a gift from God. Right. He was a natural. They He was this amazing player. No one had ever seen anything like him. And then he had to go back to the beginning, worse than the beginning, because he was you know so badly wounded and start all over and rebuild from less than nothing. And it's that that I'm talking about. Like he did the frickin work. And and if you even if you do the frickin work and you still don't succeed, I really hate the notion of going, oh, then it's all my fault. Sometimes shit just happens, right? Sometimes it it just happens and, and you are thrown curveballs that you just have to handle and have to deal with and making yourself feel bad because, you know, there's God going, if you just believed in me hard enough, if you were just, you know, in the in with the source hard enough, then all these doors would have opened. No, sometimes stuff just happens. And I think we have to accept that sometimes that's the way it is and that that's OK. And the point is not to try and be the, the guy with the thunderbolt for an arm. The point is to go, OK, I can't do that anymore. Maybe I can do something else and still be amazing, just not in the same way as I would have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can only be who we are. And and I did, you know, that sense that um there's a like she talks about abundance in this and and scarcity thinking and the only thing keeping us from having everything is belief. Um like that unlimited power. And that's hard to like process in in today's world where you know that there's many things affecting people's lives and keeping them For sure. sort of uh stuck mm-hmm. and that doesn't mean that they don't have access to the flow or the that mindset but it it's hard like this is a privilege to sit around and talk about this book and whether we're unlocking ourselves or not you know like not everyone has this time or has this freedom or has that a place and mm-hmm. um so it, it for it, sure it is a little bit but but it's also there is an aspect of it that feels like okay choices we make will affect how we move forward but um and we all have our places where we're stuck, so it's just trying to get people unstuck. But anyway, let's see what Sergio has to say about it. Thanks for letting me get in there. Um, yeah, I think uh, I loved hearing both of your uh, points. And um, so I, I definitely agree with most, uh, yeah, just about everything as Olga said. But I do like um, the way that Alan was trying to look at it as far as you know, all these other people in the universe who have been here and done that or have made this and that, that have helped you facilitate this creative energy and this um, you know, has helped you along the way in, in some way or another. Um, and that's cool, I'm fine with giving thanks to them, giving thanks to everyone around the world and the universe, but it's just having to give it to like this one person you know, that, that makes me feel uncomfortable. And I feel like for that first portion of the book, Um, Like we've talked about before, she tries to make it this like kind of inclusive thing, you know, with good orderly direction, you know, spiritual, the flow, but the, just the vocabulary that she uses and the way she talks about it, it's hard not to see it as, you know, God in the way that she portrays God. And um, for me, it was a little cringy, even just reading some of the stuff and, and just how much we're supposed to rely on that. And like, as Olda was saying, if we don't believe in it enough or follow that, spiritual path then we won't achieve these things and if we do that's 
the main reason why we did, you know, it wasn't because of us or the thousand of other people that have lived before us that helped us get where we are today. It's, it's because of God. Um, yeah, it was, it's just really difficult for me to kind of take in some of those portions of the books um, because I don't feel like it's as inclusive in the way she words it. And um, that's not to say that I don't have a spiritual side to me or, or that I don't think that faith is important or can be important and helpful. Um, but yeah, I just don't like the idea of, of, of just relying, having to rely on, on this spiritual force and that that's the only way that we can really achieve these um, creative pursuits and endeavors is, is if we believe in, in that. How do you feel about this, Megan? I really agree with what you were saying. I really struggled with this 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 chapter, especially more than all the others, even though it's kind of a thing in, in all of the writing she, she does in this book. I think um, it came up for me, especially when she was talking about it in the context of um, the, the spiritual dependency thing, because I think that what what she's really getting at there, part of her essential philosophy seems to be that you have to surrender, I, I guess, to this external force. So the idea of an external force, no matter what you call it, she thinks that you need to surrender to this external force and that's where all of your creativity comes from and then it just magically flows out of you because it's coming from somewhere else. And to me, it's just very antithetical to how I've always thought of creativity as something that sort of that I can choose to cultivate, that I have agency in. I feel like mm. framing it as something that comes from outside of me almost takes that agency away. And, exactly, and that's then, a great way to put that. Yeah, exactly. And then if, if I don't have any agency, like if if it's just me not tuning into the right button, then to me that does take away a lot of the energy that I can put into my own work. Like she talks about, um, you know, believing and then running to catch the bus. And I think that that idea does resonate with me on a certain level. Like, of course, with every huge success, especially, there's going to be some element of luck a lot of times. But if you don't, if you're not tuned into that possibility, you're probably not even going to see the bus going by, you know, until it's already gone. And so there is, there is an element there of, of being able, being in a place where you can see those possibilities and then work and then working to put yourself in a position where you're ready to take advantage of those possibilities when they do come up. But to me, I did have a lot of trouble with the idea of being dependent on something else or someone else for me to be a successful creative because it's just, it's so the opposite of how I, how I work and how I even think about the work that I do. But then at the same time, I also wonder like, why am I so resistant to that idea? Like, I, I, think, I think it comes down to that, like that element of control and that element of, of agency, which I think I need to be creative. Like it doesn't help me to think about surrendering to, to someone else. It has to come from me. And I need to be open to outside influences that can sort of help me tune into my own sense of creativity. But if it's, if it's coming from outside of me, then, then I feel like that, that's almost so disempowering to how I, mm. how I think about it. I wonder, mm -hmm. um, this is just sort of uh, <laughs> me harassing you guys. What if God was air? Would you accept that help then? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, what if God was one of us? <laughs> <laughs> well, what if God was one of us or air? Would you accept that help? I think that's a that's that it it's a little bit of a straw man question because air is something we can currently measure. Air does not take an act of faith. Air does not take any kind of stringent well, now, or strict now it belief, doesn't, right? Now. Right, but 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 see, here's the thing: like if you're in that situation, and I and I say this to my coaching clients all the time, you can you can live three weeks without water, I mean, without food, you can live three days without water, you can live three minutes without air. So air is crucial, air is important. I can accept that air is life-giving stuff. Mm. If you were to say to me, okay, air is, air is the source. I'm like, yeah, I can easily see that without air, I die. Absolutely, I could totally believe in air. Mm -hmm. But it, right now, it, it is, it is a, it, it's an act of faith religion of any sort spirituality of any sort is an act of faith so and and i and i'm and i'm cool with that i'm great with that i have no problem with spirituality or religion i think that my issue stems from 
ascribing such importance to it that it, that certain things in Cameron's world are impossible without it. That's my mm -hmm. issue. So mm -hmm. that there's a there's a distinction to be made there that is uh, that is a little different than than what I would like to see with respect to my own personal creative discovery. Okay. I mean, I, I'm not trying to like uh, be like, oh, air is God, and that's what it is. But, <laughs> but I think there, there are like forces that act upon, that we are acting upon, that we have access to, that we can use. I was thinking gravity would be a good one. We like, we live in a world of gravity. So like, and people use gravity, right? So the other thing, I, when Sergio was talking, I was thinking like, well, maybe, because I don't have this view of God as a man on a throne or a guy on any throne God. I don't believe it. At, at, at best, it's an amoeba which like split itself into two and was like, I'm God, you're Adam, whatever that was. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. most likely it's just like this Im a massive spiritual like energy force that's around mm -hmm. us. And I was just like, well, what if God is just like a, a generator that you have access to mm -hmm. if you can find your way to it? And, and not everyone knows how to find their way to it, honestly, right? Like we, we have different access points to uh, mm -hmm. this flow state or this energy. So, but what if we can't find the generator? Will we be all right? Will we be able to I like, mean, achieve you got, things without this generator? Absolutely. It just may be harder for you, right? Like, this is just like, mm. I mean, she's saying, like, get out of your own way. Let things happen for you and mm -hmm. tap into this, the abundance that does exist, right? And, and mm -hmm. No, I see what you're saying, definitely. But I understand. Like, but, it's little... but it's a lot of it's a lot of gods dropped in this chapter for sure, and mm -hmm. it's just the way she phrases, and yeah. approaches that. Yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. And right. it, there's there's I real quick. Let me Go just ahead. say real Go quick. Ahead. One of the things that I think that is wonderful about this chapter that I haven't touched on that I would like to God language and nomenclature aside, I love that she says expect abundance, expect things to go well. You know, yeah. there is this mindset shift that can take place that that, you know, you, you they say you are the sum of the five people you spend most of your time with. Mm -hmm. But also on some level, it's you are what you eat. <coughs> and I think it's you are what you think, you know. So so what if you change the way you approach some of these beliefs and expectations? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Ab no, absolutely. What? Absolutely. Oh, did you, were, you, were you going on? Or is there more? Mm -mm. Okay, yeah. No, now I was just coughing. <laughs> That's okay, all. That's all right. Uh, bless you, I guess. Or don't. Or <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, let's go on. Uh -oh. Let's talk about the flow because like, I think we. she sort of talks about we must learn to let the flow manifest itself where it will, not where we will it. And that made me think of uh, your situation with the deciding whether they're the publishers or self-publish. And then she talks about finding the river. Recovery is the process of finding the river and saying yes to its flow, rapids and all. Megan, how do you f feel about the river? Have you found it? What's going on with you? Yeah, I actually kind of did like how she approached this idea because um, I know in my own life, there's been periods of time where I was, I was really fixated on one specific path. And then being so fixated and having that tunnel vision meant that I didn't necessarily see other opportunities that were there for me to take advantage of. And so I think that the idea of being in the flow and also e expecting things to go well is, is the idea that there might be more than one path to get to where you want to go. And I think there is a fine line between that and like shiny syndrome, which I've also fallen victim to before, like wanting to jump on every single new thing that that comes along. But being in the flow, I think, is being able to walk that line between knowing when when an opportunity that, that you might never have imagined comes along, then it might be time to, to, to move on that even if it wasn't in the original plan versus just telling yourself the story over and over again that possibilities aren't there because no one is just going to come and hand you something like a fabulous opportunity for your creative work, you know, like you have, you do have to be tuned into that in order to see them and you do have to do the work in order to be ready when they, when they come up. So I did kind of like how she framed that because it seemed less about abdicating responsibility and more about, um, 
figuring out exactly where like I guess trusting trusting your gut when it comes to knowing exactly where that energy needs to go yeah absolutely like uh yeah I think that I'm just gonna respond but um it just makes me think of like the way we sort of have to pivot and like adjust our expectations and and listen to what the world is providing rather than like well this isn't the the way i thought i was gonna go i'm I'm now here and some of those things are painful and some of those things are are annoying you're like i don't want to <laughs> i want to do that thing um but before i chit chat too much let's get uh sergio's feeling about this thanks megan uh -huh. No, yeah, Alan, I was actually interested to continue hearing what you were saying, but I'll chime in just a bit. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with Megan as far as um, getting into the flow and just letting things happening. Um, and maybe to an extent where, you know, because I'm like always second guessing stuff and I've talked about before, I have really bad anxiety issues. So if I can reach a state where I'm doing less of that and, and things are a little more effortless, in that regard, and that I'm able to to see things or like new opportunities, for examples, um, with more clarity, and and can hopefully um, better discern which which is the best choice for me or which is the best option as far as said opportunities go. Um, I guess I, I think that's what it, it means to me, and I feel like as far as finding the flow or or the river being in the river I feel like I'm in and out of it I don't think it's something that I am just in that flow for like a long period of time it, it can be um conflicting I guess um if that makes sense yeah maybe it's overwhelming or something I don't know maybe I'm projecting my feelings no, yeah that's <laughs> that's part of it too for sure cool is the the river how do you feel about it uh okay I have I have thoughts <laughs> uh Big shock. So obviously Cameron is a student of Carl Jung and obviously she took the river of the unconscious or as I call it, the river of all that is to heart. She quotes Jung a lot in the book and there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to, to, to look at when you're thinking about this this universal sort of river. You can look at it as flow. You can look at it as being able to dip into and and work with and be part of even while you're a little bit separate from it. So I think that that's freaking fabulous. I love that. And for me personally, so much of this, you know, I have an I have an altar that I meditate at every morning. And one of the things that I say is, May I dip into the river of all that is and bring back what they need to hear and not just what they want to hear when I'm when I'm setting intention for clients that I'm going to be seeing that day. So my intention is from that river through me to give my clients what they need and not just what they want, because what they want isn't always the best. Right. And the other part of this is yes. as part of. <laughs> Sorry. What was that? Yes. That is. They don't always <laughs> know what they want. It's I mean, it's just true. Big uh but but also one of the other things that I say when I'm in that flow meditative state is this or something better, right? So I I never just go, this is what I want, this is what I need, this is what I want, this is what I need. And I say that to every client I work with. You know, if you're a coaching client of mine, you're going to hear that a lot because just because you want X doesn't mean X is what's best for you and X is what's in the flow and X is what's for your highest good. Maybe Y is, maybe G is, maybe L is. So staying open is part of flow if you're open to these possibilities. And that's that's so much of of what I love about listening to all of this stuff is that it's it's about being mindful, yes, but it's about being in a mindful state of open mindedness to me. This whole thing is about mm -hmm. allowing yourself to be open minded to the possibilities, but also be aware when those possibilities sort of float by you on that river. And that is to me the most important part of all of this is Am I being mindful? Am I being aware? Or am I being tone deaf on some on some level? Am I missing something that that I could work with here, that I could be part of here? And it's kind of like this this whole entire project. When I first conceived the project, I I asked the entire uh, Vegan Writers of New York City group, 
And the only people who responded were the three of you who are the core members of the New York City Vegan Writers Group, but also look at the flow we have created through these last few weeks, right? Mm, this is this is something really magical. And now we're planning some really cool big things to come after this project. None of that would have happened if I hadn't trusted Flo when the idea came up and was aware, oh, wow, this is something cool. And if you hadn't trusted that flow when you went, all three of you went, you know what, I'm going to, I know it's a time commitment, but doggone it, I'm going to say yes to this. And mm -hmm. and then all four of us together have created something that's helping many more people who are listening to get into their flow. So, so these tributaries are uh, far reaching and we don't, you don't know when you step into the flow exactly where you'll end up, but it's going to be one hell of a journey. Mm. So. That made me a little bit uh, emotional, Zolda, uh, hearing you say that uh, in a good way, though. I'm quite sensitive. Excuse me, folks. No, <laughs> but, don't um, ever yeah, apologize. Yeah, don't ever apologize that's, for that. That's, that's wonderful. No, that's beautiful. Uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful for uh, listening to the flow and, and joining this group and being here with you guys. And um, yeah, the idea of, of being able to, to help others with their flow, that's, that's a really amazing kind of thing to think about. Well, that's so what. Thank, thank you again, Isolde. Oh no, it's my pleasure, and thank you. I mean, this this is something that we we together, I think, are making happen, and everybody's got a different perspective, and everybody has another their own. You know, you all have, I have. We're all unique in how we approach creativity and art, and someone who's listening to this right now might be taking something from what Alan is saying, or from what from what you are saying, Sergio, or whoever. And, and really running with it. And there's something really uh, compelling and profound to me in that, in that mm -hmm. if we are in flow, then we pave the way for other people to dip their toe into. So I think that's awesome. Anyway, uh, moving on. <laughs> that was my that was my thought. In fact, Sergio, let's let's uh, let's hear from you next on this. Um, so I spoke about this a little bit before, but I did mention oh, sorry. that I would wanted to hear more of Alan's thoughts because he started to go into a little bit. So Alan, I wasn't sure if there was more you wanted to share as far as how you feel. Oh, I probably about... got dipped out because I got lost in my own flow of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I uh, I uh, wrote a couple things down. Like she wrote the, the source meets our needs through people, places and things. And mm. and just like what you're saying, paying attention uh, as old as so key. And mm. I've found that like, I know I've seen you complain about getting like uh, mailings in your email and how they just probably become noise. And I've realized like I get ads for, you know, whatever we're talking about. Obviously, I'm getting a lot of like screenwriting ads in my feed right now, which um, or, you know, different like production stuff. And I'm like, uh, what's real? I don't I don't know what's real. <laughs> right. And then this woman showed up and her name was Diane Bell offering like some free workshop that I should probably go sign up for. And I was like, who is this person? Why, why am I, why would I, why are they giving this free workshop? It's, it's going to be like another free workshop I took where they wanted me to sign up for their real workshop and pay money, which maybe that would be worth it. But I went and I found these interviews uh, with Diane Bell and her producer and something about the way she, I haven't seen any of her, any of her movies, but she's produced a few movies and, uh, they're probably really good. I gotta, gotta watch them. And, uh, but now I just know I want to meet her. Like, I'm just like drawn to her, the way she talked about, uh, writing and stuff. And I was like, uh, I have to, uh, figure out a way to meet this person. So that came from me, not just sort of flipping by, but like being like, Oh, I'm curious. What, who is this person? And, and maybe asking a few more questions. And then I maybe normally <laughs> would before I just signed up for a free workshop. Um, but that's that to me is kind of like the flow, paying attention, like oh, we're 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 listening to what's going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's finish this up with a well, we're almost finished. Let's try to wrap this up. But I want to know uh, the virtue trap. What is it, and are you in it, um, Sergio? Why don't you start us off? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. So, as far as um, the virtue trap goes, I don't think 
Um, it's something that I've really fallen victim to as often uh, as an adult, um, at least not in regards to my creativity. Um, I mean, sometimes, yeah, I do want to please others and I put them before me. Um, but I don't think that it's ever in an inappropriate or harmful way that might hinder or like stifle the artist in me or my creative, you know, efforts. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really see me, I don't really see those things conflicting with my creative, um, the creative side of my life. Um, but with that being said, I feel like I can see how that may be a problem for um, a lot of people, um, especially those with like children and, you know, if they're married or more familial kind of responsibilities that come with that. Um, I can see that being more difficult, right? Like she mentions the mom that wants to, I don't know, take like a painting class, but can't because her son is in Pee Wee and she wants to make sure to be at all his games and such. So that can be difficult for her. Um, yeah, but those aren't things that, that, I'm, that I'm dealing with, fortunately. At least I don't think so. Um, Megan, how about you? Is, have you fallen victim to the virtue trap? Yeah, I think I definitely have in the past. It's not something I'm really dealing with right now. I think because it's a lot, it is a lot easier to deal with that feeling when you're when you're when you're single. I think and you don't really have yeah. obligations to anyone other than yourself. But I but I think that even given that, it has been a uh, a defense mechanism and a, and a refuge for me sometimes to to invent reasons why I can't do things that are really about that that, that have to be about someone else and not me. Like oh, I'm doing this I'm not working on my creative stuff because it's more important for me to help someone else like move this weekend or whatever like I'll 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 invent I'll put little roadblocks in front of myself like that but I think I've become better in the last couple of years at knowing when and where to set those those boundaries for myself so that I can obviously show up in the way I want to for the people I care about, but also create space for, for me. And I think it really, mm -hmm. for me, it comes down to learning how to, how to value yourself in that way. Like to know that mm. you also deserve time to yourself. And I think actually this only just occurred to me that, that that's, a, I think that's probably part of what the artist date is training you to do, to set aside this time non-negotiable for, for you. That, yeah. nobody else gets to claim for for themselves or take away from mm -hmm. you and that you aren't allowed to give to anyone else so um i think yeah that's something i, I really started doing more a couple of years ago but that it's really interesting that it just occurred to me now that really having the artist date imposed like that sort of forces you to set that that time aside and i think for me even now not necessarily having that as a huge issue it does help me to to sort of see where else in my life I can sort of create that space for creative work. Mm -hmm. It makes you acknowledge things in a different way. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I, I love that because it, it is, we all have to do that. I don't think I would have gone to yoga if I didn't feel like <laughs> obligated to do something just for myself. <laughs> Isolde, how do you, how do you feel about this um, virtue trap? I am a recovering virtue trap aholic, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I the way I was brought up was you got your value from being of service. That's it. You you know you you mm. better you better be helpful. Uh, you know, and I'm a child abuse survivor, so there was there were a lot of levels to that. But I grew up knowing that if I were helpful. If I were someone that everyone could depend on for whatever, if I were super reliable, then I would get a certain amount of acceptance. And I am sure I am not alone out there in the world feeling that way. But then what that does or what that did to me was that it made me start thinking that the only time I was really valued was when I was helping others rather than when I was doing things for myself. And when I first went through the artist's way and first started looking at that, one of the things that she talks about, and it's so true, people started calling me selfish 
and a bitch and all of these other things when I stopped being so available because they were used to me being available. And mm. and and I'm still I've still got that, you know, oh, do for others, do for others, offer things for others, lend them things, give them things, do you know, I still have that as a major part of my personality. So it's something I have to be vigilant about and go, OK, be mindful about what I'm giving is that what I want to be giving? And now what I'm trying to do actively is to only say yes when I really want to say yes. Instead of going yes uh. and not really wanting to say yes, I will. I am much better at saying no than I used to be. And, and yet, it, as holdovers to my previous uh, sort of energetic patina, I guess, what I used to put out there. I just this week, I got two separate times. Uh, people were like, you know, I, I posted about this on Facebook because it blew me away. But this is what used to happen to me all the time. I got this phone call. Hey, we'd love for you to be the keynote speaker at our conference. Oh, great. Thank you so much. When is the conference? It's in June. Oh, terrific. Let's, you know, yes, absolutely. I'd be delighted. What's your budget? And then I got this. Well, we thought that you would waive your fee. And I said, really? Why? Well, because you're such a tireless advocate for the earth. Oh, okay. Well, what about hotel and accommodations and a food per diem. Well, we thought since you'd be coming to the conference anyway that you could waive that too. And I was like, so let me get this straight. Will you be getting paid? Will you be getting per diem in a hotel? And and she was like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, if, if, if you are such a tireless advocate for the earth, why don't you give up your salary? And she goes, but that's what I do. It's what I do for a living. And I'm like, yeah, this is what I do for a living, right? Mm -hmm. And so so it, it, I've gotten to the point where I tell myself regularly, it's not my job to teach this person that lesson. Like I'm telling, I have to tell myself, it's not your job, Zolda. She needs to learn her lesson the way she learns her lesson. It's not your job to teach her. But that one I really wanted to teach. I really wanted to stress that, you know what? Asking someone else to come in and do something for free that you're getting paid for is crappy. It's a crappy thing to do. And yet mm -hmm. 20 years ago, if she came to me and said that, I'd be like, absolutely sign me up. And, and mm -hmm. that energy has stayed because obviously people are still asking me. So, so you have to be vigilant if you have if you've spent a lifetime and i'm not a youngster so if you've spent a lifetime doing some of this stuff some of these behavior patterns and they keep happening you need to keep looking very very hard at how you are interacting with people and at what energy you're putting out there because you can be like you could end up like me where people are still 20 years later asking me to do things in environmental education for free at huge conferences that other people are getting paid for very handsomely. And it's because of the energy I used to put out, not the energy I put out anymore, but it's what I used to do. So it's it's held over. So you need to watch out for that virtue trap because it could be a trap long after you think that you have rid yourself of it. Ooh, so those are my thoughts. Damn. Uh, that's intense. No, that's that. I, I think you posted about that or you mentioned this before. And Mm -hmm. I, I hated that experience mm -hmm. just like <laughs> yeah everyone else is get paid but could you just come volunteer because you're the advocate it's like well isn't this yeah. a, Be aren't... because you're a great person because you're such a great person and care so much can we do this for free yeah. yeah a friend of mine told me it's called passion exploitation where oh, wow. if someone knows that you're passionate about a cause or an idea that they'll try and get you to do it for free because you're so passionate about it and it just pissed me off off i was like uh, oh now I, now i'm on fire about it because you know and and the same thing happens with artists oh but you love creating this art you you know why don't you do it for the love of the game you're an artist aren't you aren't you supposed to be doing it for the love of the game no artists deserve to get paid too right Absolutely. creatives deserve to get paid so so mm -hmm. that notion we have we as 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 a species as the artistic species or the artistic sub genus there the artist what, what what are we we are artisticum novicum and as the artistic artisticum novicum subgenus of the species homo sapiens we have got to stand up and go hey creatives deserve to be paid you have to honor that these people are doing this work 
And it's, it is work. It's not just like, oh, la, la, la. It is work. It is a career. And if you're a creative, you deserve to be paid for your expertise, for your talent, and for your skill stepping off the soapbox. No, that's okay. I, I, I'm going to just – I think we've all answered except for me, so I'm going to – Am I right about that? Yeah, right. I think so. Yes. Sorry, I should have cued you. Sorry about no, that, Alan. No, no, I just didn't want to exclude anybody. I'm at that point, but um, I uh, I have, I feel like this is something that I've been in in my in my relationships. I've definitely been like I've wanted to be available for people. I'm available for, or I felt guilty if I wasn't available, and I feel like I've even been like shamed for going to pursue creative endeavors at times and in, in, in past relationships mm. and it's been hard and i think like right now i think my, my virtue trap is my dog because i'm like i'm blaming her for everything but i'll be like oh, i hate leaving you again at home or i don't want to what do you want you need something right now you're whining at me like obviously i don't want you to be a sad or depressed dog so i'm always like oh. trying to like make yeah. sure she's okay but uh i definitely use her as like uh an excuse at times or 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 she'll like i think i said this before she'll come to me right when i'm about to do something i'm like okay (laughs) i'll give you my energy (laughs) um there's obviously more to this chapter that that there's some exercises but i want to sort of wrap up here and and i want to ask you guys if there's anything else you wanted to to talk about before we do we wrap up anyone sergio i just wanted to um yeah, I just wanted to say, I think before you mentioned that your dog can be your crazy maker or maybe something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think that. so. She's my, <laughs> and, and uh, my virtue trap. I said this before. <laughs> I said this before. I'm going to say it again. I'm pretty jealous of your crazy maker and <laughs> slash virtue trap. Um, that sounds adorable. Uh, she looks adorable from the photos I've seen. Well, if um, you ever want to take an artist date and just take her out, you're, you're welcome. To. That's a great artist date. <laughs> yeah, I would. I wouldn't mind that actually. I can take a trip uh, to Brooklyn and then take a trip, a walk with uh, with your dog. Uh, what's her name again? Uh, Theodora, and she's a polar, so <laughs> just the Thea, Theodora. Theodora. Thea or Dora? Which would? What, what should I call her? Uh, we just call her Thea primarily. Thea. Okay. Thea sounds good. I'm gonna try Dora out and see how she <laughs> see how she see how she feels <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, I love but it. But yeah, I just want to. Um, say that's awesome and thank you so much alan i think you did an amazing job hosting this week it was a lot of fun a lot of laughs as always when you're involved oh good and thank you. thank you no thank you again for doing this and i look forward to if you do if you decide to do it again in the future i'm also looking forward to isolda coming back um to host again and um yeah thank you isolda thank you megan and thank you to all the listeners i really do appreciate you and please give us any feedback um, please review the episodes if you can. Give us all the all the stars. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely. No, no, no worries. Um, Megan, uh, is Olda? Is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap this up? Um, I don't think I had anything else to add, but I I did like this chapter. Um, even though I had some issues with the 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 god stuff, it did it was really thought provoking, which I think was was the point. So um, I'm looking forward to whatever comes next. Cool. Mm-hmm. And also cool. th- thank you, Alan, for for hosting. You did a fabulous job. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, is old it? So yeah, yeah. Uh, you know me. I can, I'm a talker. <laughs> uh, so there are a couple things that I I did want to say. Uh, first, there there is stuff that she talks about, like before you go to sleep, uh, pray, whatever, whatever. If you've got a thorny problem, I have Edna Mode. The librarian who lives in my head, her name is Edna, like Edna Mode of The Incredibles. And I ask Sorry. her, yeah, seriously, oh, it's my, she's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> and I ask Edna for facts. I ask her for ideas. I ask her for, uh, if I have a thorny problem before I go to sleep, I'll be like, Edna, bring me back some ideas for solutions in the morning. And lo and behold, she will do that. So come up with what works for you, right? If something doesn't work, if, if something Cameron says is like foreign or doesn't work or whatever, try something else. I, I developed Edna, after I saw The Incredibles, she was my guide. I went, you are my guru, Edna, I love you so much. <laughs> and so, so yeah, she's been Edna the librarian who lives in my head for since The Incredibles came out. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing is, 
One of the things that happens when you're going through this book is that you question everything. You start questioning your ability to do, to tie your shoes, right? To to brush your teeth. Some of the stuff becomes really uh, intimate and and poignant and profound. And also sometimes you feel like you forget your name. And so through this process, please remember that you are good at things, right? You are good at things and you are an expert on some things. And one of the things in this chapter that she sort of she puts in a divide a little bit and i kind of want to remind you you are an expert on some things and it it is incumbent upon you to accept that you are an expert in these things and it might not be a huge thing but by gum you're an expert in something and that is somewhere to start building that's something really to remember and the last thing i want to say is alan yes phenomenal job yay (laughs) thank you so much for hosting (laughs) i appreciate that very much I, I do. It, it was it was it was it was great. It was a great conversation. And I and and uh, and spicy and salty, too, which I really appreciate. <laughs> well, you know, I like a little spice and salt. Uh, thank you so much <laughs> for letting me host. And I just had a thought, but it ran away. Um, this has been oh, no. a <laughs> try and catch it. Blast. Where did it go? Uh, it was something <laughs> it was a response to something you just said, Isolde. And I just um being an expert on something, accepting uh, yeah, that you're yes, an expert. Yes, absolutely. Being an expert on something. I just, you know, I mentioned my friend Risa a couple of weeks back, and today she put an article about uh, a, like a medium, or I don't know where it was, but it was about um, ordering <laughs> ordering takeout and how it's not actually a bad thing. It's a good thing, and you should enjoy it. And I started reading her stuff, and I was like, oh, I would never write like this. This is not uh, – she's so smart. I, I, I was like, not a <laughs> – the way I said it, it sounded like maybe I was offended by it, but I get uh, upset that I'm like, oh, I'm not this writer. And I just remind myself the same lessons I had to learn when I was an improviser. It's like, I can only bring me to this. I can't, I can't mm. be someone else that I'm not. Mm. I can't bring the history that the reading, you know, I can learn more. I can mm. educate myself. But at this moment, this is all I have. And this is where I have to start. And keep, keep up the good work. Alan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. I love that. You too. And uh, so thank you guys so much. This has been fun. And I want to take it to Isolde to take us out. Thank you. Ah, thanks, Alan. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Megan. This has been a phenomenal episode. And, and as I said, some lively and at times spicy and salty conversation. I hope that you have enjoyed this uh, episode and this chapter. And we are coming back next week with Recovering a Sense of Abundance, which I'm super excited about. Abundance is one of my three favorite words in the English language. And I am super grateful to all three of you for joining me and to you if you're listening to this. If you have questions or comments, please drop any of us a line. I'm putting everybody's Instagram handle in the show notes. You can find us there. That's a pretty good place. Until next time, uh, as always, I remind you two things. One, this episode is brought to you by Brain FM. You can, if you want to use that little app that I love so much, to meditate, to sleep, to get work done, to do your accounting, which is what I use it for. I love it for that because it helps me stay sharp and and capable in something that I am not very good at. And uh, and yeah, you can get a little discount if you go to brain F, brain.fm. I always do that. Brain.fm slash innovative mindset. You get 20% off if you decide to try it. I get a little bit of a kickback from them if you use my little Innovative Mindset all one word coupon. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset podcast, reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. (music) 